version 4.6 is coming up soon, which means that our father, Arlecchino, is about to become one of our playable characters. I'm ready to pull for her even if I lose the 50-50 because she is, admittedly, one of the most interesting and mysterious characters we've met so far, reason why today's video is going to be all about her. As always, this is a theory video. I will use information available in the game, but my theories and conclusions are not to be considered the official lore of the game, unless I got something right and it's confirmed in a later update of the game itself. Since we have quite a bit to unpack and to talk about, I think it might be better to start the video right away. Let's start with what we know about Arlecchino. She is number 4 of the Fatui Harbingers and she is the director of the House of the Hearth, an orphanage for Fontanian children. The children of the orphanage call her father, which at first seems very strange since she's a woman, but I don't think father has to be intended as parent but as priest, like the head of a church, but we will talk about this in a bit. Lini told us something about Arlecchino during the first Fontaine Archon Quest in 4.0. He said that back when he was still a child, Lynette was sent off as a gift to an eminent person who got interested in her during a banquet. When Lini sneaked out and reached this person's mansion, he found Arlecchino who had already disposed of this eminent person, rescued Lynette, and also several orphan girls who had been kept in the basement. That is when Arlecchino told Lini, The House of the Hearth welcomes you, for your interests align with ours. Here, none will ever betray you. Indeed, betrayal shall never be permitted here. Another important piece of information about Arlecchino comes from Chitose's interrogation of a Fatu's captive. This Fatu told her that several years ago there was a serious clash between the previous knave and a certain child at the House of the Hearth, which led the latter replacing the former, but not everything the Fatu said can be trusted. This usually means that some part of it is true while the rest is unreliable. If it were 100% fake, the devs wouldn't have bothered adding this story into the game. Let's cross-check these two pieces of information. We have Arlecchino disposing of the previous director of the House of the Hearth several years ago, taking her place in the process, and we have Lini witnessing Arlecchino disposing of an eminent person when he was still a child, so still several years ago. This means that the eminent person who took interest in Lynette was the previous knave, which is further supported by The House of the Hearth welcomes you. So Arlecchino had already become the director and Here, none will ever betray you. Which means that the mansion where Lini met Arlecchino was the House of the Hearth. What the captive Fatou said that could be unreliable may be the clash between Arlecchino and the previous director. Considering that several girls were kept in the basement, it may mean that the previous director, who was notoriously evil and couldn't care less about the children, was conducting some kind of experiment on those girls, and Arlecchino was one of them. She may have managed to break free and dispose of the knave out of revenge for what had been done to her and the other girls, so it's less of a clash and more of an act of vengeance. Now, something else we know about Arlecchino is that her manners toward the children of the House of the Hearth can be defined as loving. I know that most of you decided that she has to be the most brutal, evil person that has ever existed because she is a harbinger, but I disagree. I don't think she's evil, not toward the children at least. Proof of that can be found in Fremenade's character stories 4 and 5, in which we can clearly see the difference between the previous director and Arlecchino. The old knave made it her mission to make Fremenade believe that his mother didn't care one bit about him and sold him off to the House of the Hearth for money, so that Fremenade would break and follow her orders like a puppet while Arlecchino not only turned the orphanage into a place of refuge for the children, not only has she ever physically punished the children if they ever failed at something like the previous knave did, but she also told him the truth about his mother, who gave him to the House of the Hearth to protect him from the people who were after them, because no one would have ever dared to try and hurt him as long as he belonged to the orphanage. Another piece of information about who Arlecchino actually is comes from Lini's vision story. When Lynette received her vision, Lini wasn't allowed to accompany her on missions because he didn't have one. 
That's when he had the audacity to ask Arlecchino for a delusion, which made her so furious that she literally threw him across the room, simply because a delusion is a dangerous and life-threatening device, something neither her nor Lynette would have ever wanted for Lini to have. Then she reassured him because he has always found a way around any kind of problem. And that was not an exception. And as it turns out, she was right. In Lynette's vision story instead, when they managed to get back to camp after saving Lini, Arlecchino was unexpectedly there to wait for them. She grabbed them, letting the incriminating information they had to retrieve fall to the ground and be soiled, and told her that she had retrieved a far more valuable prize, that is Lini's life. These pieces of information paint a picture of a person who actually cares for the children of the orphanage, someone who sees them as people, not as disposable tools, someone who cares about their individual talents and interests, rather than just their usefulness to the mission at hand. Plus, the House of the Hearth is the intelligence gathering division of the Fatui, so their main goal is to steal information rather than engage in battle and defeat their enemies. So the children are not even raised as assassins, but just as spies. They are also instructed to flee if something goes wrong rather than put their lives in danger. The last piece of evidence that tell us who Arlecchino is are her black extremities and her eyes. Her forearms and hands are black and the color fades after the elbow, while her eyes are black with a red axe in the middle, and these features are very similar to Carter's arms and eyes. As I said before, this may mean that the previous knave had been experimenting on her, performing the same procedure that Carter underwent to become Carter Pillar 400 years ago. This leads me to another theory, probably the biggest one in this video. What is really the House of the Hearth? Let's think about it. Arlecchino knows a little bit too much about the Prophecy of Fontaine. She knew what the Tremors really meant, what was going to happen, but above all, when exactly it was going to happen. That's too much accurate and detailed knowledge, even for a Harbinger. Lastly, as I just said, she also displays the same body features as Caterpillar, one of the members of the Nesisenkoitz Ordo. Now, the Nathisan Coit's order was literally a religious sect, with René as the main minister. They had the deepest knowledge about the prophecy, and they had the Doomsday Clock, which told them at the exact moment the prophecy was going to be fulfilled. All because René's main goal was to save the people of Fontaine and of Tabat in general from the prophecy and from the subsequent end of the world. All of this seems to point to one simple conclusion. The House of the Hearth is one of the Nathisenkoitz Ordo spaces. This would explain two main things. Arlecchino's goal of saving the people from the prophecy and considering that René was the head of the sect, something like a pope we might say, it would mean that in the other bases there must have been a leader who represented that pope, like a priest in the church, and priests are usually called father by the believers, just like Arlecchino is also called by the children. But the cherry on top is René's other goal when he created the Nathisenkoitz Ordo in the Tower of Epsissimus. He wanted to create a new orphanage like the one he grew up in, the Nathisenkoitz Institute run by Director Lyris, because it was shut down after it was submerged when Elena's attacked Fontaine. I don't think it's a coincidence at this point that the House of the Hearth is an orphanage as well. Let's just say that in the next update, if Arlecchino's orphanage is a very Remurian looking mansion, then maybe I didn't overcook this theory. Let's move on to the next chapter of this video, so children, take your seats, because this is a literature lesson to explain Arlecchino's names. As most Fatui Harbingers so far, Arlecchino is going to have three different names. To make it easier, I will call them Harbinger name, Fatu's name, and personal name. Let's take our hat guy as an example. His personal name was Kunikuzushi, then he joined the Fatui and got the name Baladir, but as a Harbinger, his name is Karamush. Same goes for Ajax's personal name, who is the Fatu's child and the Harbinger Tartaglia. This more or less works for every single Harbinger except for three of them. 
Rosalind is Signora, both as a Fatus and as Harbinger. Zandek, the Doctor, is Dottore, which is just a translation. And the same goes for the Captain, who is also known as Il Capitano, yet another simple translation. The remaining Harbingers all have two separate names. Piero is the Jester, Colombina is Damselette, Sandrone is Marionette, Pantalone is Regrater, and Pulcinella is the Rooster, although he's also called the Mayor. Of course, we don't know their real personal names because we haven't met them yet, although I still think that Sandrone is a Lenguillotin, but that's beside the point. When it comes to Arlecchino, which is her harbinger name, as a Fatus, she is called the Knave. And this is a very interesting name, reason why we are going to analyze it in multiple ways. First of all, the word Knave can mean two things in English. It's either one of the cards, the Jack, or it can mean an untrustworthy or dishonest person. Now, the most famous knave in English literature is the Knave of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland, but he's not a main character at all, he only appears once or twice, really. His main appearance is during a trial led by the King of Hearts for the theft of a tart made by the Queen of Hearts. During this trial, the evidence presented for the crime didn't incriminate the knave at all, but the trial was still going against him and he didn't even say a thing to defend himself. Among the witnesses called upon to defend the knave, there was Alice herself. She began to question the meaning of the trial because it made no sense, especially because the Queen of Hearts believed that justice was based on the concept of sentence first, verdict afterwards. As Alice kept arguing about it, she kept growing larger and larger until she reached her normal height and called everybody nothing but a pack of cards. As she said this, everybody attacked her and the trial ended. Another version of the Knave of Hearts can be found in the 2010 movie Alice in Wonderland. In this case, the Knave of Hearts, Elizabeth Stane, is the Queen of Hearts personal assistant and counselor, but he secretly hates and despises her, just like any other servants of hers. And who can really <clears throat> blame him for that? Despite his hatred, he is extremely loyal to her, he's very nutly and arrogant, but that changed as soon as he didn't have the upper hand anymore. In fact, toward the end of the movie, we realize that he is actually nothing but a coward. Back to Genshin Impact, before the Masquerade of the Guilty, we thought that Arlecchino's role in Fontaine was going to be based on the trial from Alice in Wonderland, because trials and justice are the main focus in the nation of Hydro, so she was going to end up in a trial, wrongfully accused of having stolen the gnosis, just like the knave in the book, but that clearly didn't happen and nevertheless straight out gave her the gnosis in the end. If we take the movie version of the knave, we could find some similarities, like he serves an evil queen, he's knightly, he's arrogant, he's an assassin, and so on. Except for the cowardice, Arlecchino does sound kinda similar, considering that we are led to think of the Tsaritsa as the main antagonist of the story, just like the Queen of Hearts. Plus, the archaic meaning of the word knave, so untrustworthy and dishonest, can also fit. Because, you know, she's still a fatus at the end of the day, and this is also how Scaramouche and Child described her anyway. As I said before though, we are going to analyze the word knave in multiple ways, and in case you're new here and you didn't know, I am Italian, and since the Harbingers are named after the characters of the Commedia dell'arte, a form of Italian entertainment of the 16th century, I had the instinct to go and check out how the title The Knave got translated in my own language. The knave in Italian is called La Fantesca, and this name is extremely important. To be more precise, the word knave can be translated as fante, which has two main meanings. It can either be a soldier or a servant. If we look at the French cards, the knave or jack of hearts may look more like a soldier because of the axe in the background, and he is also supposed to represent Etienne de Vignol, also known as La Hire, a French military commander during the Hundred Years' War, basically the same war Jean d'Arc took part in. The problem is that, as we said before, Arlecchino's Fatu's name in Italian is not Il Fante, but La Fantesca, which is the female version of the word Fante. 
In this game, we know for a fact that some words, like God, for example, are used to address both men and women, even though there's a viable female alternative. So in theory, Arlecchino could have been simply called Il Fante, and no one would have thought twice about it. The fact that she is specifically called La Fantesca is very intriguing for a simple reason. La Fantesca, in Italian, always means servant. And this aligns with the Chinese word for the knave, Burien, which also means servant. Now, when it comes to La Fantesca, there is another interesting aspect we need to talk about. As I said before, the names of the Harbingers, so Piero, Dottore, Colombina, Arlecchino, Pulcinella, Scaramouche, Sandrone, Signora, Pantalone, Tartaglia and Capitano, are names of characters of the Commedia dell'Arte. These characters are called maschere, masks, because almost all of these characters wear one, a concept that was also reflected in the game since the majority of the Harbingers wear some sort of mask as well. The thing is that La Fantesca is also one of the masks of the Commedia dell'Arte. La Fantesca is a servant, a mature woman who serves her mistress through thick and thin, meaning that she's always ready to get her out of trouble and she also uses trickery to help her out with her secret love affairs. She is very wise, full of common sense and knows the ways of the world, but when she speaks she is very blunt and stinging but never vulgar. This is the perfect description of Arlecchino from Genshin Impact, as we witness her attitude and behavior toward Rina. This also means that her being the knave has probably never had to do with Alice in Wonderland in the first place and we all got baited once again. Lastly, we also said that every Harbinger has three names, one of which is the real personal one. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if Arlecchino's name ended up being something like Ragonda, which is La Fantesca's name. When it comes to the mask Arlecchino instead, he comes from Bergamo, Lombardy, Northern Italy. Arlecchino is also a servant, he's very carefree and cheerful but also very cunning. The plot of Arlecchino's story is always more or less the same. His girlfriend, the servant mask Colombina, is also loved by his master, the rich Venetian merchant mask Pantalone, so Arlecchino, with the help of his best friend, the mask Brighella, always finds a way to mess things up for his master, keeping him away from her. Because of his wits and initiative when it comes to putting a spoke in Pantalone's wheel, Arlecchino can be defined as a trickster. Now, to pique your curiosity, Pantalone's daughter was Rosaura, which is the character Signora is based on, and her best friend and accomplice was the servant Colombina, which is kind of represented in Geshin Impact since Colombina is the only one who's actually crying on Signora's coffin. Back to Arlecchino, his origins are very ancient. He is based on a chthonic demon, which is a demon of the underground. In the 12th century, people believed in the existence of the Familia Erlichini, a parade of souls of the dead led by a giant demon. In Dante's Divine Comedy, there is yet another demon in hell called Alichino, a member of the Malebranche, a group of demons tasked with grasping the sinners who managed to get out of the lake of boiling tar. Because of his demonic origins, in the 17th century Arlecchino's mask displayed a dark evil sneer with a small horn on his forehead. The origins of the name itself, though, can be found in different ancient languages. In Germanic it comes from Hellekenich, the king of hell, which then became Helleking and then Harlequin. The ancient pagans from Northern Europe instead believed that in winter there was a crowd of spirits of the dead that ran through the sky and the land led by a divinity. This crowd was known as the Wild Hunt, and if you read, played or watched The Witcher you're definitely familiar with this name. The Wild Hunt was later called by the French as El Le Quin, and it represented the women who rode horses through the night with the goddess of death, Hell. With the passage of time, this goddess then became a man, King Herla or Herla King, from the Danish word Erkenig, literally meaning King of Elves. On the other hand, Arlecchino, the actual mask of the Commedia dell'Arte, is one of the evolution of the Zanni, another mask, a servant of Venetian nobles and rich merchants like Pantalone. The Zanni is characteristically something like a sharp villain, but on many more occasions is just dumb. 
We would call him a povero diavolo, a poor devil, someone who doesn't have the means to achieve what he wants and is also very unlucky to make it even worse. When it comes to the Fatui Harbingers, there is a neat difference with their respective masks from the Commedia dell'arte. The Harbingers usually display the complete opposite of one of the characteristics of the original masks they are based on. The easiest example is Tartaglia. In the Commedia dell'arte, he stutters when he speaks, and he does that so much that he is completely incomprehensible, which is the reason why he is called Tartaglia in the first place, since the name literally means he stutters. In Genshin Impact though, Child speaks very fluently and probably a little bit too much, he is charismatic, convincing, compelling, so the complete opposite. Analyzing Genshin Impact's Arlecchino, she is a servant, which is confirmed by her Chinese name, but also by the fact that she calls herself as such. I am a servant of Her Majesty the Tsaritsa. She is sharp, she is cunning, she can be considered a villain, and her true form is probably very diabolic, but she's definitely not a poor devil, without the means to achieve what she wants, nor is she doing everything she can to go against her master, the Tsaritsa in this case. On the contrary, it feels like she used the Tsaritsa for her own agenda, because becoming a harbinger would have given her the means to obtain the Hydronosis and save Fontaine from the prophecy. We don't really know how far Arlecchino's allegiance to the Tsaritsa really goes. She did call her a real, real Archon, Archon, but that was more of a comparison with Purina rather than a declaration of faith. She also told us not to be too preoccupied with sides. So it doesn't feel like she really has any kind of allegiance in general, just means to her ends. Now that we talked about the diabolic origin of Arlecchino, I think it's time to talk about her real form. As I said before, she shares two key features with Carter, the black forearms and the black eyes with a color symbol. Since Carter's body is that of an animal hillature rogue, the symbol in his eyes is a teal crescent moon. Arlecchino's symbol instead is a red axe. This leads me to believe that her real body, or the body in which her consciousness has been placed into, is that of a pyro hillature rogue, a kind of enemy we haven't encountered yet. And this also aligns with her pyro vision, but also with the fact that her star rail counterpart, Mother Ahem, <coughs> Bolt Hill, is part cyborg. The story may be simple here. 400 years ago, René tried to save Carter, Alain Guillotin's assistant, from his chronic incurable illness by using the same treatment he used on Jacob, that is eating abyssal materials. What René didn't take into account was that Jacob was unexplainably unique, so consuming abyssal monsters and materials only made him stronger until he literally became an iniquitous Baptist. Carter, on the other hand, sadly wasn't unique, and because the Abyss is extremely toxic to humans, the experiment brought him only atrocious pain and suffering. That is, until René successfully managed to implant Carter's consciousness into the body of a hillager. He lost most of his memories, he doesn't even know who he was before the experiment, but he survived. Considering that the Nazis and Koitz Ordo still exists in the present, it is possible that they kept studying and perfecting this experiment for 400 years. This takes us to the recent past, in which the previous knave kept orphan girls into the basement, which usually means that they are test subjects that need to be kept away from people's eyes. As I deduced before, Arlecchino was most likely one of these girls and the experiment was successful. This opens up to a debate about her real age. Some may think that she is hundreds of years old, some may think that she is actually as old as she looks, so around 30 years old. We could use what the Captive Fatou said about a child that defeated the previous knave, but when Carter became Caterpillar and was finally able to transform into a human, he transformed into a child, so we can take this proof and throw it out of the window. Both theories can be right, to be honest, but I tend to believe that she may be as old as she looks, because she disposed of the previous knave in what seems to be an act of vengeance. 
This could mean that the previous knave was the one who experimented on Arlecchino, who was still a child like the other girls that were kept in the basement. Now when Carter was turned into Caterpillar, it took him a very long time before he could wake up and be sentient again, and above all, to learn by himself to transform into a human form. With 400 years of scientific advancements and now knowing that a Hillichard person hybrid is capable of changing its aspect, the amount of time for these steps to happen would have been shortened. Now, let's pretend that Arlecchino was something like 5 years old when she was experimented on, because that was more or less how old Lynette was when she was taken away. If we account for the time it took Arlecchino to regain consciousness, plus the time it took her to learn to transform into a human, it may have taken her 10 to 15 more years. Then, like before, Linny and Lynette were children when they met her for the first time, so again around 5 years old, and now they look like they're about 15 years old, so 10 more years have passed since then. This would make Arlecchino actually 30-ish years old. Not every Harbinger needs to be Centennial, they just need a peculiarity or a special power that puts them above the others. Child received his powers when he saw the old Vari Narwhal, and he also spent months in the Abyss for example, and this is what allowed him to become one of the Harbingers, despite being a quote unquote normal human, at least in terms of his age. To conclude the video, something really interesting is the fact that Arlecchino doesn't wear nor carry a mask with her, like most of the other Harbingers do. Piero, Dottore, Signora, Colombina and Capitano wear some sort of mask, be it an actual mask, a helmet or a lace on the eyes, while Child wears his mask on the side of his head. Arlecchino, Pulcinella, Pantalone, Sandrone and Scaramouche instead don't wear any kind of mask. Now, if the masks are actually needed to save or shield them from the side effects of their delusions, which could make sense since Creepus used the delusion without a mask and died while Diluc used it while wearing a mask and is still alive, then Scaramouche and Sandrone wouldn't really need one. They are both puppets, so they are probably unaffected by their delusions. If you're wondering about this, I think that the real Sandrone is the Fontanian looking ruin machine while the little girl is his puppet, just like its Chinese name, Muo, the puppet, implies. Pulcinella and Pantalone both strangely wear glasses, so I wonder if they have something to do with it, leaving Arlecchino as the only one without a mask, nor an accessory, nor a clear explanation for the lack of it. Unless we consider the fact that if her body is actually that of a pyro rogue, then her human form is quite literally her actual mask. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you're interested in Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. I think that my next video is most likely going to be the analysis of the 4.6 livestream since we are getting a new region and we will see a preview of what's going to happen with Arlecchino, so I won't be able to ignore it, which means that my next video will come very soon. Let me know in the comments if you're pulling for Arlecchino and if you are, good luck with the polls. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, over and out.